Boom! And we're live. What's going on, guys? Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for choosing this podcast to listen to. Uh, I truly appreciate it. I always say thank you. That's how I start off my show, so thank you. Uh, I want to start off this show because, yes, there's so much going on in the sports world. Everybody, there's so many sports shows, right? So everyone's talking sports. But this one particular story uh, stands out to me the most, and I can truly relate to. Although different circumstances, I can relate to. Because I've been told no a lot, and I've been doubted a lot. And that's why I have this chip on my shoulder where I will work harder than the next guy. I feel there's always people that are going to be more talented than you, stronger than you, more intelligent than you, tougher than you are. You're never going to be the best, 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 best. And this whole planet, we think George St. Pierre is the greatest of all time. There's probably someone that's never fought in the octagon that could beat him. We think LeBron James is the best. I, my point is, it's very, there's always somebody that's probably better than you at this. But I can make sure everything that I can control, I do the best at. Work very hard. Uh, everything I put, I'm dedicated to, I'm interested in, I give it my all. If you don't put in your all, you're not going to get anything in return. You get, you get what you put in. So my point is, I've been doubted uh, in basketball, for example. So I felt I... Middle school. Well, it goes all the way back to middle school. So middle school, honestly, it started in rec league. Wow. So it started in rec league, like, ah, oh, this guy's the weak link. Can't dribble with his left hand. Damn, I only scored two points that game. Okay, next season, I scored 10 points in the game. Okay, hold on. He scored 20, but he can't dribble with his left. Let's expose his left hand. So then you just, you get better, right? Well, in middle school, I didn't make the team, and I was just, like, heartbroken. So I showed up to practice one day. I didn't make the team, but the coach said, hey, it was very close. We want you to still be involved with it. I said, okay. I showed up after tutoring one time, and because I'm not good at math, but I, again, put in the work to get a good grade in math, so I'd stay for tutoring. And then I'd show up at the gym, put in my lap, stretch, worked out. The coach at the time was like, hey, I need you to warm up. I said, I already did. I said, hey, I need you to uh, stretch. I said, I already did. Hey, I need you to look at the plays because we're about to sub you in. I said, I already did. So he was like, really? I said, yeah. He's like, who'd you do it with? I said, myself. He said, really? And I said, yeah. He's like, he gave me a nod. And I was like, okay. So then I ended up being a walk-on on the team and I ended up playing. And then at the end of the season, we had a, break, a record-breaking season for middle school. And um, I ended up getting an award. And he said, you know, this guy didn't even actually make the team and I'm going to give him an award because not only did he surprise everyone, but he worked hard. He's, a hard. he's the hardest worker I know. And he showed up to gym one time and he already did his laps. He already stretched. He remembered that moment. So I was doubted. Then I got doubted into high school. Um, didn't make the JV team my freshman year and I felt like I should have. I really felt like I should have. I was like, I'm better than these guys. Coach pulls me aside. Hey, we want you to try out next year. Just work on a couple things. Okay. I show up next year and killed the tryouts, absolutely dominated, made the team. But then I had issues because I was in the IB program at the time, International Baccalaureate, which is a very um, involved, huge, huge amounts of homework, tests, um, studying. And at the time we would travel to Orlando to play a lot of these games. So I wouldn't get back until like 12 at night, 11, 12 at night on top of all this homework, having to wake up at four or 5 a.m. to hit the bus because it's such a big school, Spruce Creek had like 3,000 students there. So my parents were like, no, you're not keeping up your grades in the IB program. So I didn't make, so I got taken off the team. Heartbroken. Transferred schools, my parents got a divorce and everything. I end up going to a different high school with my best friend, Rob. And I make the varsity team. Play, senior year, I become a captain of the varsity team. We break the school record, 28 and three. And I got the award for Mr. Versatility. I had college opportunities to play, but I chose to pursue broadcasting. I'm not saying I had an offer to Duke or anything, but I mean, just the lower, lower end schools. But my point is, I've always been told no, or you're not good enough, or people said, oh, you're not good enough to start your own podcast. All the time, all the time. It started when I was young, not even just basketball. I can go for days about, hey, you're not going to get an A in this class. Hey, you're not good at wrestling. Hey, I don't think you're going to do good in this jiu-jitsu tournament. And then I end up placing in first place in two divisions so this happened to me all the time and I noticed that it's something that 
you now maybe not everyone has this quality or some people do or most people do but when you get you when you've been doubted a lot in your life or in a category it creates this chip on your shoulder where you want to outwork everybody you want to work out every i want to outwork everybody i would show up uh rob and i would show up at the ymca before school started 5 a.m do laps put shots i'm, I'm slow i'm not fast so i would be on the track or i would do whatever i could to become a better in whatever i was pursuing and now i brought that to the podcast game i brought it to my education in college i, I try to do that in everything i do now but my point is this is this is how I relate to DeMarcus Cousins here. Am I the athlete of DeMarcus Cousins? Absolutely not. Haven't torn my ACL. I'm not an NBA superstar. But what I'm saying is everybody is saying DeMarcus Cousins is done. Absolutely done. He'll never come back, never be the same. Are the odds stacked against him? Absolutely, yes. He probably will never be the same. But just like how people told me no, or people told you that's listening, no, you can't do this, is the exact reason why you end up doing it or overcoming it. So who am I to sit behind this microphone on my podcast and say, DeMarcus Cousins, you will never be the same. You won't be able to do it. Who am I to say that? I don't know who he is. I don't know what he's doing behind closed doors. I don't know the type of grind that he wants to put in. Now, like I said, are the odds stacked against him? Absolutely. The bigger you are, the injuries typically don't get better. They don't. They do not get better. That more The, the weight, the, the stress on your joints and your knees and doesn't get better. But who am I? Just like the people that told me, Max, you can't do this, and I end up doing it, who am I to tell DeMarcus Cousins you can't do something? Like I said, all of these analysts, all these people have opinions and say he'll never be the same. He may not be the same, and like I said, he probably won't be. But who am I to tell DeMarcus Cousins he won't be? Who am I to tell DeMarcus Cousins he won't be? And for those listening, uh, DeMarcus Cousins, in case you don't know, he's a former All-Star, one of the best big men, at the center positions in the NBA, just got signed to the Los Angeles Lakers off a of vet minimum because he has an injury history, tore his Achilles, played in the finals after he missed the majority of the season because he was injured. So he has an injury history that he's been battling. And it's very hard for somebody to keep recovering after injury after injury. Kind of reminds me of Derrick Rose. But like I said, the bigger you are, typically makes it harder, makes it worse. But I'm saying, I wanted to say this because it doesn't feel right for me to sit behind this microphone and say, DeMarcus Cousins, you will never be the same. Because who, who am I? Who am I to say that? And I, I just, like I said, I'm not saying I'm nearly as talented as DeMarcus Cousins with basketball or I'm not in his shoes. I don't have millions and millions of dollars. I'm not super famous. So I'm not trying to say I'm DeMarcus Cousins, but I can relate in the fact that people have told me no all the time and continue to tell me no. It's not like all of a sudden they stopped. People tell me no all, every day. People say, you're not going to do this. You won't become this. Uh, you shouldn't do this. And it's only motivation for me. That's why I'm grinding as hard as I am. And that's why I will get to where I want to be. And nothing's going to stop me from doing that. And I can only imagine DeMarcus Cousins' mindset right now. I guarantee you, he's saying, okay, keep counting me out. Now, is he probably morally defeated? Sure, he just had another torn his ACL in practice. I think it was in Las Vegas. I'm sure he's hurt. I'm sure he's upset. Like I said, the odds are stacked against him. But who am I? Who are you? Who is anyone to tell another person they can't do something? So I just want to... Now, does this put the Lakers in an, an awkward situation? Yeah. Because I don't think they put all their eggs in the DeMarcus Cousins basket. I don't think they did. I think they understood he has an injury history. They have LeBron James. They have Anthony Davis. They have Kyle Kuzma. They have a pretty good roster for... I mean, they waited so long to try to sign Kawhi Leonard, and I would have done the same thing, so they can only pick up the pieces that were available, which are good pieces. Danny Green, Avery Bradley, uh, Rajon Rondo, Quinn Cook, Dudley. They re-signed McGee. They have a good roster to go with two star players and a rising young player in Kyle Kuzma. So adding and acquiring DeMarcus Cousins was a low-risk, high-reward situation. The low-risk meaning it was a vet minimum, so you weren't paying them a ton of money. It was a one-year deal, so if something happened like this and he doesn't recover, you're not stuck with that contract. But the high reward is, what if you get 80% of DeMarcus Cousins, who once was the best center in the league? So it was a low-risk, high-reward situation. The Lakers are 100% right for getting DeMarcus Cousins. And it's not officially over that DeMarcus Cousins won't become or won't play this season or won't be back or can't be 
DeMarcus Cousins. Now, will he be 100%? Like I said, odds are no. But who are we to say he is done? No one can say he's done. DeMarcus Cousins is DeMarcus Cousins. He knows when he's done. Like I said, he may be. But we don't know. We don't know. But now this is truly going to put Rob Palenka in a position where you need to see what you can do. What, what is the next move? Do you sign another center? Do you get a Dwight Howard? Do you get another guy? Do you put AD at the five? And the answer is, for me, in my opinion, you put Anthony Davis at the center position. I know he says he wants to play the four, and it's 2019, 2020 basketball. And it's about matchups. It's about... The game is more high tempo now and shooting threes. I like Anthony Davis at the five. He can easily guard the center position. He can guard one through three. Now, I don't want him guarding the quick guys, but he can move his feet exceptionally well for a big guy. So him at your five, I put LeBron at the four, Kuz at the three, Danny Green at the two, and maybe a Rondo or Quinn Cook at the one. That is a very good lineup. It has shooting. It has defense. It's quick. It's not too old. I like that lineup. I don't mind Anthony Davis at the five. I don't know why everyone says you need to go get a starting center. I don't understand that because, yes, AD at the four is nice when you had DeMarcus Cousins. They had that chemistry. They both played in New Orleans for the Pelicans. They had that chemistry, that brotherhood. So just you don't have to rush and get – now, should you get somebody? Probably. You need another center on your roster. But just to anoint someone as the starting center for your team may not be the best move. So this is truly going to put Rob Palenka in a situation. It's testing him on what's going to work and what's not. It's easy to say, hey, here's a group of guys, succeed. But a true and a very good and intelligent GM has to be able to overcome adversity. And Rob Palenka has been under a lot of scrutiny and criticism over this couple of years with the Magic Johnson drama, the Genie Bus, the LeBron James. There's been a lot of drama around this front office. And... They kind of silenced a lot of it by getting Anthony Davis, that they really needed that, and then it slowed down the drama. But it's still the biggest franchise in basketball. You still have LeBron James. It's going to be a lot of noise regardless. But the last thing you need to do is panic and do something that's just going to satisfy the headlines but not really satisfy basketball needs. So this is going to truly put Rob Palenka in the position to either fail or pass. Plain and simple. If he's a true GM, you make the best of the situation. You don't panic, and you don't just get somebody with a name that you know, but it doesn't really fit. I don't mind Anthony Davis at the five. I don't mind if they get another center because they need to fill that spot. They need to have another backup center just in case McGee gets injured. I understand that. But just to anoint someone that you sign as the starting center may not be the best situation. So I just wanted to put the, pump the brakes on that. <sighs> I, I, getting doubted is a very powerful thing. I've realized, I've learned more, and I know this sounds kind of cliche, like you learn more from your failures, but I truly did. Like if I wouldn't have been cut, if I wouldn't have been told no, I don't think I would be who I am now. And I'm not saying I'm almighty and perfect, but I certainly think those have taught me a lot of life lessons as far as keep moving forward when someone tells you no. Like there's nothing that I like more than proving someone wrong when I've been doubted about something. And I feel I've overcome the challenge, and I love doing that. That's why I like going to the gym a lot. It's just, oh, I don't think I can get that last set, and I do get that last set. It's just such a great feeling as I'm very competitive, but at the same time, it just feels rewarding to overcome something that you've been told you can't. So I'm just saying I don't want everyone to close the book on DeMarcus Cousins just yet because I don't think that's fair to him, and I don't think any one of us is in the position to say that because we are not him. We have no idea... How he's going to recover he obviously has motivation because he's overcome a lot of injuries and he has the the power to keep pushing so who are we to say he he can't do it again like i said odds stacked against him absolutely but who says he can't who says he can't i want to shift gears to another it's kind of a I'm not trying to be negative here but another sad story it really is sad to me and it's really disappointing I am a huge Conor McGregor guy, huge Conor McGregor guy, huge supporter of him, absolutely love him, one of my favorite fighters. But Conor McGregor, you need to get your act together. This is absolutely ridiculous. I don't care any publicity is good publicity. That's nonsense. That is not true because Conor McGregor is a mega superstar and all it's been is bad publicity. 
And that is not the narrative, as many of people think. That's not really his brand, per se. If people remember, I want to take you guys back. Conor McGregor, in the early stages of his, of his rise to power and fame, he was relatable in two ways. One, he owed the Irish Debt Bureau, like, money. He was broke, and he bragged about actually getting money and getting his first custom-made suit, and he was on this chase to money. And, but we remember him as he didn't have it. He started from nothing. Just watch the documentary. It's a real film. Secondly, he's very patriotic, right? So those are the, he had the whole country of Ireland behind him. So there's two things that people relate to, patriotism and financial struggles. And he had both of those. And we saw him climb the ladder to generational wealth, tons of fame, and belts and accomplishments. True, amazing, brilliant story. Absolutely love that part. Absolutely love that part. Now, has he always been crazy and out there, flamboyant, a lot of trash talk? Yes, but he backed it up. He predicted the round he was gonna knock people out. And he was the first to ever hold two belts. He was the first to go up two weight classes and have that great record-breaking fight with Nate Diaz, lose the first one, bounce back and win. Yes, I get that. He's been a headache, but he was, he was a very frequent fighter who loved to fight. And then this, I feel like this fame has officially changed Conor McGregor and is hurting his legacy. It is absolutely ridiculous. A uh, video just came out of him hitting an older gentleman over the dispute of whiskey, is what the report says. Do I know the whole story? Absolutely not. But still, this is whether you do not hit an older guy over what we're told is whiskey, and the older gentleman, if you watch this video from TMZ, is not standing up, is not trying to fight Conor McGregor, is sitting down, and Conor McGregor, who's, I guess the guy's probably in his 50s or 60s, strikes the guy, hits him square in the face with his left hand, his power hand, Hits him straight in the face and he has to get pulled away. It's not like this guy got up. It's not a young, just cocky dude that's putting his face all in Conor McGregor's face and pushing him. No, this is an older gentleman who's probably talking smack, but is sitting down. This is insecurity at its finest and it's somebody who's abused his power and is absolutely ridiculous. Ever since the Floyd Mayweather fight, I get it. He's got tons of money. Conor, if you don't want to fight in the UFC again, then don't. But this doesn't give you the right to do what you are doing. You jump over the cage and slap the referee. And you slap a commissioner. Stupid. Okay. Made a mistake. Get over it. You throw a dolly at the bus. Stupid. Okay. Get it. You fuck Habib. You lost. You got humiliated. You lost. And then there's a... This comes out again. And then you're smashing someone's phone. At some point, he's veered off. Uh, I guess after all this money and fame, he has veered off from the two things that made Conor McGregor patriotism and the struggles and his rise to success. It was a true and brilliant story, one of a kind, and now he is ruining his legacy because the old Conor McGregor was very arrogant and a lot of trash talk, the best in the game, but he backed it up. Conor McGregor, you are a UFC fighter who has not backed it up in a while. And that's it. If you don't want to fight in the UFC ever again, who am I to tell you you should? But what you're doing is wrong. And it's not right. And just from a human being standpoint, to hit an older guy, to smash the phones, he feel I feel like he has become entitled, and he lost the retro. He lost the perspective of what it took to get him there. And I just it's sad to me because if you don't want to fight in the UFC, then stop flirting with the idea. If you're one hundred percent wanting to fight, then just focus on fighting. This is this is nonsense that is hurting your legacy. Absolutely. Awful. Awful. And it just keeps happening. It's not like a one-time thing. It's not a two-time. This is like the third, fourth, fifth incident that you just can't stay out of trouble. Support yourself around some good people. And if you want to focus on your proper 12 whiskey, go right ahead. If you don't ever want to fight in the octagon again, that's perfectly fine. You're a smart dude. You have your clothing line. You have so many good things coming on and so many things you've accomplished. Just why are you focused on this? What does it matter who this guy is talking smack to you. You are Connor freaking McGregor. When does it matter? Stop being so insecure. You don't have to be macho and win every single argument. I'm just so tired of seeing this. It's just, he is literally ruining his legacy where now we don't even think of the success story. We think of someone who has tons of money and fame and is just constantly in the news for being a bully and a jerk. That's what it's turned into and it is sad.
It is absolutely sad. He doesn't represent patriotism and the struggles financially and rising to fame and having generational wealth and multiple belts. That was a true brilliant story and he is ruining his own legacy. Because I don't know if you remember Conor McGregor, but you haven't won in a while. So it's not like you're winning and you're doing this, which you shouldn't do in the first place is doing this type of stuff. You are losing and then you're doing this. If you don't want to fight again, that's cool. Perfectly fine. But hitting an older gentleman, stomping on iPhones, throwing dollies into the truck, it's just like enough is enough at some point. And it, I love Conor McGregor, but enough is enough. Enough is enough. And it's just so sad to see because I was always defending him. And now it's just, it's, it's, I can't even defend him anymore. I simply can't. I watched this video. This guy's not challenging him physically. Like I said, I didn't hear the audio. I don't think, I don't, no one, not that I know of, no one really knows the whole story. Well, I, I certainly don't. There's no report of what happened besides a dispute over whiskey. Because I know Conor McGregor owns his whiskey, the proper 12. That's his own brand. But why are you so damn insecure that you have to strike the guy? And it's just sad to see because I want to talk about UFC 241 and Nate Diaz's fighting. And they were still supposed to finish their trilogy fight. They're one and one. They both defeated each other. And I see this and it's just, man, can the guy stay out of trouble if he's not in the octagon? Can he stay out of trouble? I don't know. And it doesn't look like it. <sighs> anyway. I want to talk about UFC 241. <laughs> I want to talk about UFC 241. It's one of the best fight cards of the year, and I'm so excited. Uh, I want to start off with Nate Diaz, because I just talked about Conor McGregor. And Nate Diaz's last fight in the octagon, if I'm correct here, is against Conor McGregor, where he lost the five-round war, record-breaking fight, and he's fighting Anthony Showtime Pettis at welterweight. And I believe Anthony Pettis is the betting favorite. I picked Nate Diaz to win this fight off his pure endurance. He runs triathlons. His size, he's long and he's also a big dude for the weight class. Brilliant jiu-jitsu and very underrated boxing. I think he is susceptible to getting leg kicked in this fight by Anthony Showtime Pettis, but I just think Nate Diaz's mental toughness, his physical toughness, his just unbreakable chin will be too much and too overwhelming for Anthony Showtime Pettis. Um, but to me, what this fight resembles is not just how talented Nate Diaz is, but it resembles to me, and it will be a coming out party for Nate Diaz as far as his own superstar. I think most general MMA fans, not if you're a hardcore MMA fan, most general MMA fans, or if you just watched him fight in Connor, you just think of him and Connor. Nate Diaz is his own superstar, and he's going to beat Anthony Showtime Pettis, and he's going to call out Connor McGregor. Now, I don't know if that fight can come to fruition because I don't know what happens with this TMZ video with Connor, which is just so mind-blowing to me. It's just so dumb. But if he can manage to make that fight again, his stock is just going right back up. Now, Nate Diaz is a special talent, the younger brother of Nick Diaz, but this is going to be Nate Diaz's time to just show he's his own star. He's not just the star of Connor McGregor. So many people are, so many people are excited to see Nate Diaz return. Uh, he was smoking at the open workouts, and it just reminded me there is no other Nate Diaz. A lot of people are trying to mimic Conor McGregor, his swag, his trash talk. Nobody can mimic Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz is just as authentic and raw as it comes. He does not care what you think. He doesn't care what he says. He doesn't care what the media says. He's very nice if you're nice to him, but he could care less what you think of him. You, he could care less of what it looks like. He says what's on his mind. He says how he feels. He's very real. And I absolutely respect Nate Diaz. And I think he's going to put on a clinic against Anthony Showtime Pettis. He's going to call out Conor McGregor when he wins. And it's going to bring his star power back and make people realize he wasn't just riding Conor McGregor's coattails. Nate Diaz is a star by himself. And he's going to show it this fight card. He's going to show it. I absolutely think he's going to just put on a clinic on Anthony Showtime Pettis, who I love, by the way. I think it's going to be a very entertaining fight. Uh, I just think Nate Diaz is too much for him. I could be wrong. We'll see. But I just think he's too much. We also have Yoel Romero on this fight card. It is just such a great fight card. But I obviously want to get into the main event. We have Daniel Cormier versus Stipe Miocic. And it's for the heavyweight title. Daniel Cormier was uh, the champ champ. And now he's the undisputed heavyweight champion. He won the first fight against Stipe. Knocked him out. 
And Stipe has been waiting for this rematch, right? This fight means the world to Stipe. And I think Daniel Cormier is just such a true professional. It means the world to him, too. A lot of champions in his position, it wouldn't mean as much to the champion that beat him than it did for the guy who lost. But because it's Daniel Cormier, he's a grinder. He's so smart. And that's just who he is. I know he's not looking past Stipe. And I think they both weighed in the lightest they've ever been in this weight class. I think it was like 236 and 230. Daniel Cormier, I've said it once and I'll say it again, is going to beat Stipe Miocic in the rematch and call out John Jones. So we could have the potential of two super fights in the making between Daniel Cormier and John Jones and Conor McGregor and Nate Diaz. Does it happen? The Daniel Cormier and John Jones will. I'm not sure about the Conor McGregor just because of all the legal issues. Daniel Cormier and Stipe is so damn interesting because Stipe is so talented. He has the most title defenses in UFC heavyweight history. Uh, he's a firefighter on the weekends. And I think he's one of the most underrated and underappreciated stars in the UFC. So I'm pro Daniel Cormier this fight because I think he's going to win. But I'm not looking past Stipe. Stipe is so talented. And if he wins, it sets up a trilogy between them. So I don't, I don't think this is Daniel Cormier's last fight either way. But I just, I think we're going to see Daniel Cormier break another barrier. And by that I mean, he's already an all-timer, right? He's a champ champ. He held two belts simultaneously, the light heavyweight and the heavyweight division. That's the, the big gladiators of the sport. And he holds two belts at the same time. I think Daniel Cormier is going to knock out Stipe and he's going to enter tier one. And tier one is just John Jones. I, and my tiers, it's John Jones, then tier two is Habib, the Daniel Cormier, the Conor McGregor, and the Amanda Nunes. I think he's entering tier one and I think he is going to challenge John Jones for the GOAT status. Now, I don't like throwing around that GOAT, the greatest of all time term, just willy-nilly. I think people throw it around way too much. But if you think about what he's done, who he's beaten to become a champ champ, an Olympian, to beat the most the decorated heavyweight in UFC history and Stipe Miocic, the most title defenses, and if he is to fight John Jones again, he is challenging John Jones for the GOAT conversation because right now to me, John Jones is the greatest fighter to ever step foot in the octagon. But if Daniel Cormier wins again, and he fights John Jones. And let's just say hypothetically, because I don't think it's crazy that he beats John Jones. He could be the GOAT of mixed martial arts. An Olympic wrestler, underrated boxing, just knocked out Stipe in a great ground game. And he's such a great representative for the sport. He's a commentator. Daniel Cormier is entering the GOAT conversation if he hasn't already. And I don't think anyone's thinking about that. Because we like the flashy and the flamboyant. And what he is is a grinder. He is a grinder. He gets that from his wrestling background. That's just who he is. He will outwork people, like we talked about in the beginning of the podcast. Daniel Cormier can beat John Jones. The only person he's ever lost to, he can beat John Jones. Am I saying it's going to happen? I think it can. I think it can. I'm not making a choice right now. I'm just saying I think it can happen. And if it is to happen, if it were to happen... He is right up there in that GOAT conversation. The greatest of all time. When you look at who he's beaten, the Stipe's, the Bigfoot Silva's, the Derek Lewis, the Dan Henderson, the Alexander Gustafson, Anthony Rumble Johnson, like the list goes on and on. And it is unbelievable what he's done and what he's represented and what he's accomplished. And let's not forget, he's 40 years old and he's still the champion. When Randy Couture came out of retirement, I think it was 40-41, he beat Tim Sylvia back in the day. We were like, wow, a 40-year-old is in the octagon because it never happened. Daniel Cormier is 40 years old and he's looking like he's still the best in the world because he is. That is unbelievable and I think a lot of people are taking that for granted. He is 40 years old, dominating. Absolutely dominating. And I think he does it again this Saturday. Daniel Cormier is breaking Tier 2, entering to Tier 1, he will face off with John Jones, and the rest is history. The rest is history. I just want to see those two in the octagon. That fight determines who's the greatest. It determines who's the greatest. Because if he can do that after the streak that he's on, who is anyone to say he's not the GOAT? He's beaten Anderson Silva, too, who's right up there in the GOAT status. Yes, he was older. It was short notice. He beat him. He dominated him. 
Daniel Cormier is one of the most underrated. And it's so crazy, too, because he's just been on fire for so long. He's so, he's so popular. But when I hear the GOAT conversation, I typically hear George St. Pierre, Anderson Silva, John Jones, Aldo, Demetrius Johnson. And it's like, no, Daniel Cormier is 100% up there. And he will be up there. And he could be the GOAT. But... That's all, guys, for this episode, UFC 241 Breakdown, DeMarcus Cousins, Conor McGregor. It's been a crazy week. I have John Jones, uh, not John Jones, I have John Fitch on the show Sunday after the fights. We're going to break down UFC 241, the results, what happened, what to make next, uh, talk about some upcoming things for him as well. Absolutely always a pleasure and honor to have him on. He's a good friend and truly one of the best minds in MMA and just in general. So. Appreciate you guys. Download and subscribe this podcast on any podcast platform. Check me out on YouTube if you wanted to watch this video instead of just listening to it. YouTube, subscribe, tell a friend, share, and follow me on social media, Max Van Auken. But other than that, guys, have a great weekend and peace.